given by the structure of the wind stress curl. Um, but this is not everything. This is just the, the north-south velocity. So it would be nice to know the east-west velocity as well. And the way we can get that is by remembering that it's a near geostrophic flow, so it's very close to being horizontally non-divergent. So, um, so we can actually use a stream function to represent it. So if we um, calculate the stream function, so the velocity components are given by the derivatives of the stream function, so we can integrate the velocity in x um, to give us the stream function. All right. And then we can differentiate that in y, and it gives us the u velocity, so the, the east-west velocity, all right? Um, which, is, which is just related to the north-south gradient in v, the integral of the north-south gradient in v. Um, so now we've got, um, it also shows that the east-west velocity, the zonal velocity, is related to even more complicated features of the wind stress field. It's related to second derivatives in the wind stress. Okay, so this is the, this is the north-south derivative of the curl. Um, all right, so there's this x naught that pops up here in these integrals. So this is a longitude at which the east-west velocity is zero. So if you like, this is, this is um, to do with a constant of integration we have in, in that. And we kind of have free reign within Sverdrup theory to choose anything we like for that. Um, if we've got a rectangular, but we have to choose some value. And if we've got a rectangular ocean basin, the east-west flow has to be zero at the east and west boundaries, okay? So we've got u equals zero either, both here and here. So both of those are candidates for our longitude x naught in these integrals. Um, both of those are equally valid within Sverdrup theory. Um, so if you choose x naught to be this edge, then as you integrate away from that, you start to get um, larger eastward velocity. So these, these contour lines are contour lines of, of psi, the stream function. So the flow is going along those. So this is purely southward flow here. This is mostly eastward flow here, mostly westward flow there. Um, and so this is a, a gyre that's being forced by this particular wind stress. And so if you look at that, that's an anticyclonic wind stress curl if we're in the northern hemisphere, uh, which we are. And so you can see some interesting features here. You've got the, the, the latitude at which the wind stress itself is zero is the latitude at which you have the fastest southward flow. Okay, so the wind's not even blowing there, but it's, pu it's pushing the flow south because the wind has a curl. All right, so it's to do with the gradient. And the north-south flow is minimum, or zero at the top and bottom here, the north and south boundaries, because the curl is zero there. All right, so this is where the wind is blowing strongest, but its curl is zero, so the north-south flow is actually zero. So it's all a bit counterintuitive. So getting back to what choice we have for this, whether we, where we put x naught, both of those pictures are equally valid solutions within the, within the Sverdrup model. Um, both of those are equally valid responses to a wind stress like this. Which one is correct? That one, okay. So both of them, so it's clearly incomplete. It doesn't tell us which way, which way around this goes. And also, somehow or other, all this water here has to get up there. And there's nothing in the Sverdrup theory that'll allow it to do that. Because the Sverdrup theory is saying the water is going south everywhere. So it can't be going north here, right? So the wind is not, is not something that can drive the water back that way. Um, all right, so Sverdrup theory is great, but it's incomplete. We have to work a bit more on that. Um, oh, just a little. No, and I'll come back to this. That thing of, of, a, of the, the zero here happened to be the maximum curl and the, and the maximum stress happened to be zero curl. Those are just features of this particular artificial wind stress profile that somebody's dreamed up, okay? It's, it's a textbook kind of wind stress profile. It doesn't necessarily apply in reality, and I'll come back to that. So anyway, if we, if we know from our, if we assume from our knowledge of oceanography that X naught is on the, on the eastern boundary, then from the wind stress curl, we can calculate the Sverdrup transport. So these are, um, these are stream, um, stream lines, so um, stream function contours. And so just from a knowledge of the wind stress curl, you can work out a whole lot of what's going on in the ocean, the, the transport. So these are the gyres going around this way, going around that way. Uh, all right. Okay, I got a bit carried away with alliteration here. 
Um, the, and I should have said seven. Um, <laughs> that would have been nice. And it's section seven as well. Um, <laughs> so I've said a lot of these things already. So the wind data is enough to, to predict the, the location of these gyres. So it's, it's answering some of the questions I posed at the start. Why are the gyres at those particular locations? It's because these are the locations of anticyclonic wind stress curl. So that defi is defining the, the latitudinal range of those gyres. It's also explaining why they rotate in the way they do. And it's also giving us quantitative information about the total amount of water going around. So it's quite a powerful thing. Um, but there's some interesting things. So as I said, the, um, the meridional velocity is largest where the wind stress curl is largest. Not necessarily, and this, this may actually be a latitude of zero wind stress, right, where the wind isn't even blowing. Um, and similarly, the zonal velocity is, is in a, related in a fairly complicated way to the wind stress. Uh, we have no reason to choose eastern or western boundary currents. And there is no northward flow across the zero wind stress curl line. Okay, so there's a, there's a latitude in the ocean, or there are regions in the ocean where the wind stress curl is zero. So here's a, imagine roughly there's a line through there, you've got a zero wind stress curl. So there's no north-south motion across that line. So if that line happened to be aligned east-west, that would actually be the boundary for the gyre. So water can't flow across that because V is zero there. So that defines the limits of the gyres, sort of. And this is something that people often don't realize. That only applies if the wind stress curl is aligned east-west in its structure. So if it doesn't depend on X. Um, Here's just an example from um, Ryan's in shop uh, some 20 something years ago now. Um, so this is wind stress curl pattern. This dotted part here, that's anticyclonic and this is cyclonic. These are stream function contours, the so streamlines. We've got anticyclonic circulation here, cyclonic there. You can see this is the zero wind stress curl line, whereas this is the boundary between the gyres and the wind stress curl line, zero wind stress curl line runs through there, okay? So you can't simply look at the zero wind stress curl line if it's not aligned east-west and say that's the boundary of the jar. It's a little bit subtle. Is that anything to do with that? That's to do with, um, well, it's to do with the, um, the total amount of this, if you integrate it across that, is relate, will tell you where V is zero on the, on the west coast. So if you, if you sort of integrate this across there, you find this is the latitude where the, where the zonal integral across there is zero, and that one's up being that la the latitude where V is zero on the west coast. Yeah. So you can see if this doesn't, if this doesn't depend on Y, then it all works out hunky-dory like in the textbooks. Um, the other thing is that a latitude of, of zonally, of locally maximum U is not necessarily um, not necessarily latitude where the north-south velocity is zero in the sphere drip solution. So this allows us to actually have what, um, nested gyres. So here's an example. Um, if, you, if you apply a wind stress curl to the ocean, you end up with, um, you get actually a partial separation of the East Australia current. So V is actually non-zero at the place where U is largest. So you get a strong offshore flow, but you also get some southward flow there, and that's actually that feature actually comes straight out of the wind stress field. Um, and it's something that you, that, yeah, you don't get with the textbook wind stress profiles, but you do get with realistic wind stress profiles. Um, and also, so you can have nested gyres, there's a little gyre within a big gyre, and in fact the gyres can connect with one another across ocean basins. Um, so there's a little wrinkle. If you've got an island as one of your boundaries, the pressure on that island, so the boundary condition for the stream function is not necessarily the same as it is on the other coast. Um, and there's a trick you can do to work that out. It's called uh, Godfrey's Island Rule. Um, and you can work out things like the, the volume transport of the Indonesian through flow from that. OK, so that's all well and good. Um, but we need to somehow work out how the, how the water gets back to where it started from. And so we need to scale that vorticity equation and find out how to get these terms big enough to produce a flow this way. So because the wind stress is pushing the water the wrong way, we need to have a wind stress curl. 
we need to have these terms somehow become larger in some region of the ocean, large enough to push the water back the other way. And if you look at, the, look at these terms, that's, that's the vorticity, so that's related to the velocity divided by the length scale. And here we've got derivatives of the vorticity, so that again, will, that term again will become larger as the length scale gets smaller. So the narrower a return flow is, the larger these terms become. So you can imagine if the current gets narrow enough, these terms will be large enough to dominate that and allow flow in the opposite direction. Okay? Um, and also, another thing we can see is, if the return flow is in a narrow current, what does that tell you about its velocity compared to the speed of velocity? It's going to be a whole lot larger. Okay? It's carrying the same amount of water through a narrower pipe, if you like. It's going to have to move faster. So, so the narrower the western boundary current is, the faster it is compared to the sphere drip flow. And, um, and so in a narrow western boundary current, the V will actually be very much larger than this term. So this is actually, you can actually show just from that argument that the surface wind pumping, the direct wind force in the western boundary current is not only in the wrong direction, it's actually negligible in magnitude compared to the other terms. So this is getting, getting to one of those puzzly questions I put at the start. All right, so we can neglect the wind stress in the western boundary current or in the return flow. And we've got two kind of extreme cases. We might have the, the north-south flow being driven by that term or by that term or by a combination of the two. We're just going to look at extreme cases where it's just one or the other. Um, so if, if we've got a particular velocity of the western boundary current and a particular length scale, and we don't know either of those, you can actually use that as a scaling, um, use that to scale those terms. And um, so this is the scale of that term, this is the scale of that term. And if that term is to balance that one, you can see the velocity actually cancels out and you can e easily rearrange that to get the thickness of the western boundary current, which will allow that balance to form. Okay, so there's one particular length scale which allows this bottom friction term to produce the north-south flow. And it's this, um, it's called the Stommel length. So Stommel came up with it, surprisingly. Um, and that's how it goes, okay? And likewise, if that one is to balance that, there's a particular length scale of the Western Boundary Current result required for that. It's, it's the Monk length scale. Um, so I'll just go through those two examples. So if it's one balancing three, uh, <clears throat> we've got, um, and let's, let's just, just consider a case with Northern Hemisphere subtropical gyre. So we've got a northward flow. So V, WBC is positive. And um, for that to work, this right-hand side needs to be positive. All of this stuff here is positive, apart from the minus sign. So this thing here has to be negative, all right? So the, the wind, so, and this is another way of saying that the vorticity in the western boundary current um, Not too hard to solve. I got a bit slack and didn't actually write the solution down, but it's available in lots of textbooks such as Vallis. If you actually want to see the uh, equation for it, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's actually a oscillatory offshore and exponentially decaying. And um, the reason for that profile, that particular shape, you can actually see from here. So just jumping back to the equation, what we've got here is you need to have the third derivative of V with respect to X being positive if you want a northward flow in the northern hemisphere. And, the, um, and so that's actually the second derivative of the vorticity has to be positive. So let's just have a look at that profile and see how that works. This is the profile you get out of the maths. Um, and it's got this sort of curvature in the velocity take the derivative of that, you get this dotted line. So that's the vorticity profile. So you can see you've got zero vorticity at the peak velocity. You've got cyclonic vorticity onshore, anticyclonic offshore. Look at that profile and think about its second derivative. You can see it's positive. It's cupped upwards. So the, the viscous term has the correct sign there to allow the flow to go northward. Okay? Um, if you do that on the eastern boundary, 
it just doesn't work, okay? The vorticity profile is the other way up. You get a negative viscous term. So the viscous term there will be driving the flow in the wrong direction, okay? So that's not possible, this is possible. All right, so in both cases, we've got return flow having, having to be on the west. Um, I'll nip through this a little bit quickly. One thing to, I'd like to point out though is that the western boundary current thickness scale, that's often used in, in ocean modeling um, as a thickness scale for, for working out what resolution you need or equivalently what friction you need. So if you've got a, if, if you want to, well you need to resolve that length scale to get a good representation of a western boundary current. That length scale is set by the horizontal eddy viscosity you choose. So if you've got a grid of a certain size, a certain coarseness, that actually dictates how, how small you can go with your eddy, eddy viscosity. Because if you get too small with eddy viscosity, you won't resolve the western boundary current. So a coarse model will tend to have a, an overly, uh, overly large, uh, overly wide western boundary current for which you need an overly large eddy viscosity. And then the current will be too slow, too wide, and have too little vorticity to it. Okay. Um, so you can go some way with this. This is um, if you apply the observed wind to the North Atlantic and just to a Stommel Monk balance. So now we've oh, so it's further up here, Stommel and Monk here, so both bottom and lateral friction. It looks something like reality, but the outflow here from the Western Boundary Current is very broad. There's no clear separation. If you compare that to this, which is the sea surface height equivalent of that temperature movie I showed earlier, this is what it really looks like, or much more realistically looks like. You've got this narrow western boundary current separating over there. Um, so there's something missing. We've missed quite a few important things. We've missed stratification. It isolates the flow from the bottom friction. And it also, the western boundary current is a frontal boundary between, um, between warm and cold water. Um, so there's a whole lot of imp important effects there because of that. There's topography and there's coastlines. There's also nonlinearity. I'm just going to touch on that briefly. Um, nonlinearity has been known right from the very start of this theory, actually, that, that the Rosby number is actually not that small. And so it's always been thought of as dodgy to have a linear theory. And, um, and you can work out that the Rosby number is something like 0.1. Um, so what we've dropped in having a zero Rosby number solution is we've dropped the advection of vorticity by the velocity. So that's, that's a term out of the material derivative um, of Q. And, um, and so we can't, so if the Rosby number is not small, we can't make this approximation of, of ignoring relative vorticity compared to planetary. And also, if the Rosby number is not small, it's actually possible to get meridional flow, north-south flow, without changing relative, without changing uh, potential vorticity because a north-south gradient in the relative vorticity can compensate for beta. All right. Um, so I'll just show you some examples of what happens. So these are a bunch of, at the top here we've got the Stommel solution, that's the Monk solution. These two ones have different side boundary conditions. This is a no-slip condition, this is a free-slip condition. They don't look very different. This is with linear, so this is zero Rosby number, and as we go down the page we're increasing the Rosby number. And what you see is the western boundary currents start to intensify downstream. So these are rotating clockwise. It's intensifying downstream. It's, it's sort of separating from the coast. It's forming these recirculations. And particularly with a no-slip condition, you actually get this sort of flow separation going on. Um, another example of that is here. These two flows are identical. It's a circular basin. These, these two models are absolutely identical, um, except for the side boundary condition. So this has got a no-slip condition. This has got a free-slip condition. So that's a zero vorticity on the coast is zero velocity on the coast. Um, so we've got this very asymmetric flow. We've got this recirculation going on here. We've got a separation of the western boundary current. And that can be explained if you look at the vorticity field, oh, sorry, the potential vorticity field. So these colors now are representing potential vorticity. And you can see here, the potential vorticity is being sort of swept downstream by the western boundary current. And it's curled on itself. So we've got this region here where the water can go around in a circle, if it likes, following contours of constant potential vorticity. And, um, and so you've got closed potential vorticity contours and fluid can actually move around those without any input on the right-hand side from wind stress or bottom friction or lateral friction. So, so this is actually something that you can spin up to a much larger transport than Sverdrup would allow. And, um, 
And so these things, these are, things are called uh, inertial recirculations. You can see there's a, there's a bigger one here, all right? Um, so we've got sort of sphere drop balance here. Up here, these are inertial recirculations. So that's a, one of the characteristic features of a nonlinear Western boundary current. I think I'm just run, about to run out of time. Um, but I'll just mention, one problem with numerical models of the ocean is often the Western boundary currents don't separate where they ought to. And here's an example. Um, it's the same model, basically, but this is a um, but, but different grid size. This is a 14 kilometer grid. This is a 3.6 kilometer grid scale. And this has got 100 square meters per second viscosity. This has got 10 eddy viscosity. Every other way, they're the same. You can see this is where the boundary current's supposed to separate off Cape Hatteras. This is the Gulf Stream. But it's bumbling around here along the continental shelf. And so in this model, it's putting warm, salty water in totally the wrong place. So if this is a coupled climate model, for example, which it isn't, but if it was, it'd be messing up all the fluxes, causing all sorts of havoc. If you increase the resolution, it starts to separate in the right location. And it turns out that something like one-tenth of a degree, or about, one kilometer, about 10 kilometer grid spacing, is sort of the minimum you need to get this to, to happen properly, which is very unfortunate because it's quite a high resolution. Um, just to finish up, one thing I haven't talked about is adjustment and how the, how the Western Boundary Current and the, and the jar spins up in time. So this is how it looks. What we've got, this is a um, nice, simple, circular model of the ocean. The wind starts off, switches on at the start, and there's no flow to begin with. And you can see a whole lot of features traveling westward. What do you think they might be? I'll start it again. This should be looping, but it's not. Anyway. What's going westward? Rosby waves, yeah, cool. So, Rosby waves are actually what communicates information about the boundary to the interior of the ocean. As the Rosby waves propagate across, they, they kind of leave the sphere drop solution in their wake. All right, so once the Rosby waves from the east have passed a given point, you're pretty much in the sphere drop balance at that point, and you end up in a steady state. So the time scale for the ocean to adjust to a change in wind forcing is given by how quickly the Rosby waves cross the ocean basin. And the, um, sorry, I'll try and start that again. Um, and there's two different time scales, really. There, there's, there's barotrophic Rosby waves, which can cross the ocean basin in a matter of days, uh, or a week or so, okay? So the barotropic structure adjusts very quickly to changes in wind stress. So it'll, it'll, it'll track wind stress curl changes. There's also baroclinic Rosby waves, which can take um, year, a year or so, sometimes several years, depending on the latitude, to cross the basin. So the baroclinic structure adjusts much more slowly, and that tracks only interdecadal kind of time scales in the wind stress forcing. Anyway, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll leave it there. Um, there's a lot of detail in the notes, so have a look at those if you like, they're online. So, so this, this um, idea of having a boundary current where it fluid can sneak back to the latitude where it's not allowed to go, yep. uh, this happens other places too. So in the stratosphere, All right. um, waves break and they change the momentum of the stratosphere, then the air has to slump toward the poles. The only way to get back is at the surface. Oh, and okay. I was thinking of the Southern Ocean. So in the Southern yeah. Ocean, you might have a wind stress curl. It turns out, with this particular value of AV that I've used here, is the bottom friction and then the lateral friction, okay? Um, I should also say, I'm just gonna be using these as representative values of the eddy viscosity in the horizontal and the vertical. Um, eddy viscosity is a parameterization of small scale eddy motion. Um, there's really no theory for giving good numbers to that. It's a kind of try things, see what works well. These are values that are in the range that are used, but they're not hard and fast numbers, okay? I'm just, I'm just gonna use them for scaling purposes. So anyway, the upshot here is that on the largest scale, this is the largest term. So on the basin scale. Um, and that is the balance that Sverdrup came up with in 1947. So this is where we dropped out those other terms. We've got the north-south motion being driven by the surface Ekman pumping via the wind stress curl. All right. So one important thing to notice from this is that the north-south velocity is not related to the wind stress, it's related to the curl of the wind stress. Okay, 
Um, so if we've got an anticyclonic wind stress curl, as in a subtropical gyre, um, that is acting to reduce the potential vorticity of the flow in its magnitude. And that's, so it's driving an equatorward flow. Um, so we've got, um, so if this is anticyclonic in the northern hemisphere, that's negative, and you can see V is negative, so it's towards the equator. Okay? Um, opposite is obviously the other way around. Cyclonic wind stress curl drives a poleward flow. Um, another thing to notice here was in the scaling analysis is that we ended up with a north-south velocity of something like one centimetre per second. And this is driven by this vertical Eggman pumping of about one micron per second. So we've got something like a 10,000 times speed up. This vertical horizontal flow is about 10,000 times faster than the vertical Eggman pumping, which is actually causing it to happen. Um, and one way to think about that speed up is that it's related to how small beta is. So beta is something like two times 10 to the minus 11 um, per second per meter. Um, and because beta is small, the, the fluid columns have to move a long way, have to change their latitude by a large amount to find a latitude that suits their new potential vorticity. Okay. Um, and um, sort of a little bit like if you're squeezing a lemon pip between your fingertips, um, you can think of your fingertips as being almost parallel. Okay. You move them together at certain, a certain speed, um, the, the pip has to move a lot faster that way to, come to, to adjust to the, the relatively slow movement this way, and you end up with a large velocity. So the, the smaller beta is, the larger V is for a given wind stress curl. So on a large planet, if beta was smaller on a larger planet, it'd have to move further in latitude to change its potential vorticity. Um, another thing, we've got something like 0.1 meters per second here.